today with you. Um, our speaker today is somebody I've known for years, a great friend, uh, somebody we've worked with on many projects. She's a former operations manager at Motif, uh, which is Africa's uh, biggest marketplace, and it's in Uganda. She's also she also used to work with uh, the Innovation Village in Uganda, which is also one of the biggest, actually, I think it's the biggest entrepreneurial space in Uganda. Uh, she also worked at uh, Women in Technology Uganda, the generation nonprofit organization that aims at empowering, inspiring, and training the next generation of Uganda female leaders, business women, and technologists. She's a social behavior change communication specialist, formerly working with Straight Talk as a communicator for the last 14 years, a counselor for the last nine years, and a trainer of trainers for five years. Irene holds a master's in business administration international, in international business, postgraduate diploma in project planning and management, a bachelor's degree in environment management and a diploma in journalism and mass communication. She's very passionate with a dream to inspire and motivate young people and women. She's a strong advocate for the use of creative channels to extend information and services to young people and the community, to inspire, motivate, learn and change behavior. I present to you our speaker today and please enjoy her. Thank you. Thank you very much, Asia, for the good presentation. Um, uh, Wangari, I've seen a concern that we need to start with the national anthem. <laughs> I'm not sure uh whether that is still the plan but somebody has uh, raised that concern so uh, uh, if we are starting yeah. with the national anthem yeah yes. let's start uh, with it and then i can okay. progress hmm. that's okay so uh, thank yeah, you very much fine. okay thank you very much madam asia for uh, that introduction of uh, our our speaker and uh we will be able to start off with the Kenyan national anthem and then we will come to the Ugandan one. So uh, Madam Irene Kitui and Madam Asia, you let us know who will be able to give us uh, uh, one stanza of the Ugandan national anthem so that we can be able to have that as the prayer for our, our day to day. And uh, that's what we normally use uh, for uh, as we start off our sessions um, at, at Wasiliana Hub. So we believe that you are comfortable with that and uh, you'll be able to also uh, 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 give us the Ugandan national anthem. So we'll start with the first stanza of the Kenyan national anthem, and uh, that will be in Kiswahili, and I will take us, uh, through, uh, take us through it uh, in Kiswahili. E mungu nguvu yetu, ilete baraka kwetu, haki iwe ngao na mlinzi, na tukae na undugu, amani na uhuru, raha tupate na ustawi. Over to you, Madam Kitri. Okay, can I go through the Uganda anthem? I thought it was singing. Let me try yes, to make it twice today. Mm. Oh, Uganda, may God uphold thee with a future in thy hand. United, free for liberty together will always stand. That's all. Thank you, Asia. Um, Wangari, can you project, please? Uh, but I will, I will get started as a we we'll wait for you to share your screen with the PowerPoint presentation. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Madam Irene. Please proceed. Okay. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. As you I have been introduced, I'm Irene Kitui, and um, I'm glad I'm speaking to you today. 
in Uganda, every time they introduce me, I know the first question people always ask is, are you Ugandan or Kenyan? And uh, I have to explain to them that I'm a Ugandan, but with the name Kitui. I hope that was not uh, something that ran in your mind as well. So we are looking at media advocacy and uh, storytelling skills. I'm going to try and be as much, I want to use 15 minutes uh, for the session to begin uh, with the power presentation that I have shared. And then we're going to the practical and try it out with the points that I would have given you in terms of how do you plan your media campaign. So uh, one of the things uh, about um, advocacy is we need to understand, I want to ask to define the main words that we have in this. So we have the media, what is a media? Media is a medium of mass communication used to spread or transmit information from a source to the general public. It's from the source to the general public. Sometimes we use it for sharing information to the individual, but because you're using media, it doesn't just go to one individual, it goes to a big number of, of people. So it's from a source, which can be anyone to the general public. And this includes, we have what we call print media, the newspapers, the magazines, those ones uh, in journalism, we put them in a category that we call print media because it's printed. And then we, we have what we call audio broadcasting. So audio broadcasting is radio because we're using only sound. Radio, uh, when you hear somebody talking on radio, that is audio broadcasting. Then we have audiovisual broadcasting. So audiovisual broadcasting are the TVs because somebody is using a screen, huh? recording both the visual and the audio. And that means uh, YouTube, when somebody has a YouTube live, Instagram live, they are doing audio visual broadcasting. And then we have social media. Now social media, uh, in our local terms, we have put the internet in social media, hmm? well, searches in social media, uh, Facebook, WhatsApp, Instagram, there's now TikTok, all that is falls under social media as a package. Uh, what is advocacy? Advocacy for me means openly supporting a certain viewpoint or a group of people. And for this class specifically, our interest is in conflict transformation. So we are advocating for conflict transformation. So Every time somebody starts an advocacy campaign, you should have a certain viewpoint that you are having, that you are going or that you are following. So media advocacy, media advocacy is the use of, is the use of any form of media to help you promote an organization's or company's objective or whichever comes into your mind as a vision or a group that this is what we want to advocate for. So basically media advocates, we are saying we are using media and um, in the use of media, we are using it to meet the organization's objective. So every time you start a campaign, you need to ask yourself, what is our objective? Because if you start a media advocacy campaign and you don't have an objective, trust me, it will flop. Now, I imagine for us here now is we want to make, to change the way the communities member, community members look at conflict transformation. So that is our objective. And that should be one of your objectives. One, secondly, we want to create reliable and consistent stream of publicity. One of the reasons people do media advocacy campaigns is because the media and people in that space don't understand about that campaign or they are not giving it much attention that it requires. So therefore that's why you start a, a media advocacy campaign because you want to create reliable, true information 
that and it's consistent coming from the right source to the public for them to understand your cause. Then to motivate community members and policy makers to get involved. All media advocacy campaigns that I have participated or seen usually have a point of policy that they want to change. There's a policy that they're working towards to make sure that it's worked on. I remember one of the media campaign advocacy campaigns we did was we were uh, asking the government to make sure that birds um, ask for the national ID so that young people are not involved in alcoholism. And our campaign, the purpose was the national ID should be made something that uh, people know that every time you go to a bar, as long as you look at somebody and you believe they are young than, young than 18 years old, they have to give you their national ID before you can sell alcohol to them. So that was a campaign. So what is it? We wanted a policy change at one point. We wanted it to be made into a policy that people understand and buzz do. And even the people who manufacture, the companies that manufacture alcohol needed to know that. So on your point of view, which policy are you looking at? Or what do you want the community members to know? You know better. So I need to see that into your presentations today or to, for the people that will be giving us uh, next. Next, um, let's look at the role of media in all this. Why do we have media? Next slide, please. So the role of media here is to make sure that we inform the media and then through them, they inform the public. Now, for them to be able to communicate, sometimes they're not talking about conflict transformation because they don't understand it. It's not their strength. It's not something fancy for them to look out for. So therefore, what we are doing here is we are informing the media and using them to be able to reach the public. The other issue is to use media to pressure policymakers to change, to make change that affects conflict transformation. Like I mentioned earlier, always it has to have a, an objective. And sometimes we know that something in the community changes when it's a policy. I remember, um, I know I'll give a lot of alcohol campaigns because that's what uh, we participated in. I remember one time uh, we were in uh, local districts and our campaign was for them to make sure that the bars don't open early. Uh, as 10 because people are getting drunk early and it's leading to domestic violence and all things. Because we had done research and realized, yeah, the cause were against domestic violence, but it came from somewhere. And one of the things was alcohol and people were getting into bars as early as 10 a.m. So we worked with districts. I remember we worked with a district, one of the districts in Uganda called Kabale, and they passed a law in some of their local sub counties to say that bars only open at 5 p.m. If a bar is found open earlier, that would be a crime. And it, it was passed into a policy. So we worked with policymakers using our media campaign and also meetings with the policymakers. And then they were able to pass that into a policy. So here as well, I imagine, as we are looking at those policy change makers for conflict transformation. We want to influence the media to give your organization or your group or your coalition or everyone you're participating with intensive coverage. There's a lot that competes with media for attention, especially the main media, the visual and the audio, the broadcasters, the radio stations, they're looking for different things. So if you don't deliberately go to them with this campaign, they might not understand why. They might not know why it's important. So we want to influence them to be able to speak about our cause and make it at their forefront of their communication. Because if we don't, it will still have a back seat. And then give the communities control. Once you use media, you're giving the communities power and this is something very good because it helps and this do community change. And then to persuade 
uh, the media to be able to continue covering such campaigns. Next slide, please. We are looking at how to set up um, media advocacy campaign. One, like I mentioned, identify your objectives. So in conflict transformation, what are our objectives? Before you even know which media uh, plan I'm going to use, start with what is our objective? Two, select a target audience. Who am I targeting? Now, our, and, and when you're selecting target audience, there's always primary, secondary, and everyone else. Now, there are campaigns that we start, advocacy campaigns that we start, and you know, at the beginning point, I want to start with the policy makers. So you create messages and plans and media uh, uh, strategies that will target the policy makers. Then after that, you say, after the policy makers, I want to come to this other section. So the alcohol campaign we did of underage, we started with policy makers. We knew we needed the policy makers to make it into a policy. And I remember we worked with the Speaker of Parliament then, which was Rebecca Kadaga. And then we knew the other people who are important were the manufacturers. And I know the campaign spe uh, specifically worked with Uganda breweries. So that was our other target audience. Then we knew the other important people as well were the bar attendants, the bar people who are selling the alcohol to the young people when they went to buy them. But also we knew the shop attendants as well. So that was our other audience that we had to cater for. So, that is how you have to think, who is my target audience? What is this objective that I'm trying to meet? Who is specifically that I need to think for? I know sometimes we say, oh, we meet. we will need the whole public, the general public. Yes, you need the general public, but then you still have specific people you want to start with. Like I said, alcohol is a problem. We needed the, uh, the general public, but we knew where to start from. And one of the things we later learned in the campaign was uh, parents were another target that we needed to really take care of because they're the ones that have mini bars at home. So children go and take the alcohol from their parents' bars. So those are the things that we learned with the campaign. Then after setting up the objectives, knowing your target audience, now you set up the plan. Because the target audience have different ways to reach them. Um, you set up a plan on how to reach this target audience that you have, you have come up with. One, you know, if you need policy, then you have to make a plan of how do you meet the policy makers. Uh, if you want to, to meet uh, the community parents, how do you, target them. So you need to have a plan of how and where and when to meet them. And then also in that plan, how do I reach them? Policy makers might be print media, print something and put them. Community members, you can start with the poster and then radio, because we have realized radio also works highly. If young people, then it has to be Facebook. It has to be Twitter, but remember Twitter is also news and action and immediate. And we have just learned, I have just learned recently that social media uh, in Uganda, is women, men take 65% of social media and then women 35%. Now it was interesting when this survey came, this research, when somebody was presenting it and I said, how come even Instagram? And he said, yeah, Instagram, as well, 65% of men consume the data on Instagram and the ladies who are 35% are the ones who provide the data that the men are consuming on Instagram. That was interesting, but you need to understand that and make a plan, be flexible. Things change. You might think uh, my plan was, so always know that you can start with plan A and end up with plan D because plan A has to have some changes. So be flexible 
Uh, the other thing is you need to keep your ear on the ground, be able to listen, to know what is happening. Like I told you, our campaign started with, the alcohol campaign started with, we want policy makers, bartenders, and then we realized, oh, parents also have mini bars at home. So how do we target them as well? And then keep it indefinite. It should be something that we keep on talking about, keep on talking about, because the challenges that are happening never stop because your campaign has stopped. You might be, we go out with a boom and then reduce, but make sure you're in people's ears about this campaign and what you are talking about. Storytelling, uh, it literally means telling the story. I have nothing much to say. Uh, so the person who has knowledge tells the story of his or her experience uh, to people to, and this the purpose is for them to gain information. Next slide, please. And that is broken down for you. So we are saying, telling the story, the person is sharing their knowledge, conveying it to you in terms of words, sketches, images, maps, and sound. And often, yeah, we, we, we add on those stories to make it bring the point at home. I, I, I remember my grandmother was very good with storytelling. And every time we did something, she had a story for it. And there are things that even when I hear some sound, I know, hmm, that is this. If, if you had my grandmother say, saying Salume Nabuchachi, that means you are lazy. That she had a story about a lazy girl called Salome and uh, she used to sing it. So every time she sings it, you know she's telling you, ah, you're being lazy. So this was a lazy girl who didn't want to work. So that is adding a little flesh, a little spices to her story. Next slide, please. So we are seeing that um, stories have not started now. It's, it's an ancient thing. There's history we can show, they are showing us from the caves. And then I like this picture. And then the parents there, unfortunately, it's not um, African pictures. But then that is how the story storytelling has, and it's also happening in boardrooms as well. Next slide. The benefits of telling a story is, one, you transfer knowledge in a tactful and interesting and fun way, and it sticks. Like I have told you, the story of laziness has sticked. My grandmother used to say a story of, of a lady who didn't want to close the door because there's competition. You close and you close, and then that affected you. Um, it nurtures good human relationship because of that connection and transfer and also brings passion to the audience. Now, when do we use storytelling? One is when we want to transfer knowledge and also at the same time, when we want to share the lessons learned. Uh, next slide, please. The main principles of storytelling. For you to be a good storyteller, you should have good presentation skills. So for you to be a good storyteller, improve on your presentation skills, and then you would have got it. So those go hand in hand. Storytelling and presentation skills go hand in hand. When it's an audience that you are talking to, please keep eye contact. Why? Because when you look at the audience, and that's why this is sometimes tricky when you're doing online classes, because no one, you're not seeing people, you don't know whether they're bored or, because when you keep eye contact, you see how people are reacting to the story you are telling them. Is it interesting? Is it fun? Um, are they learning something? Are they curious? So that's really communicates. You have to be enthusiastic and also have good expressions. Um, we speak with all our body, our eyes, and people will see if this story you're telling, you're telling it with all the, you're enthusiastic about it and giving them good impressions. They'll have fun when they're listening to this story. 
everything begins with good preparation. If you don't have good preparation, if you're not prepared, you'll mess it up. Always have good preparation. I've always people, I've had people saying, oh, we're just going to save a story. No, it's not about it. We're just going to save the story. You need to prepare to say the story so that you don't forget to say the important parts in the right places. I always give people an example that I love cooking. And if you're teaching people to cook and say, now we're going to teach you how to prepare pilau with there's meat, there's rice, there's water. And then in the process, you tell us the ingredients that we need. And then in the end you say, oh, I forgot, by the way, you need to add uh, salt and make the onions uh, a little dark. There's no good preparation there. You need to be, have good preparation. Have a, um, a good use of the voice and uh, a good volume. What do I mean here? If, if I came to this presentation and said, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, today we are going to talk about uh, media advocacy and media advocacy is about uh, using the media and media is, you see, I'm using a voice. Is it a good one? No, I don't think I'm even sounding any better. So you need to use your voice well and that tonation. Mm -hmm. There's the way we change your tone when you're emphasizing the point, when you're passing on a point and all that. So use your voice well and a good volume. If I started shouting, hey, today we're talking about media. No, I, I don't think that would be fun. So be able to know that you use your voice well and the volume very well. And that also comes to the talking speed as, as well. Uh, if I said, so today we're looking at principles of storytelling and good presentation skills are important, eye contact, that would not be nice. Let's have a very good uh, speed. And then use your body language. What do I mean by the gestures, the hands and so on? Trust me, people, um, people uh, listen more, look at your body language before they even take your words. We look at the body first. And, and unfortunately, you can't see me. But if, I, if you came to my home and I have this flat face and I'm saying, hi, oh, you're welcome. But I really have this flat face. I don't think you'd come in. You say, oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, we'll just come to check on you, bye-bye. Even if your intention was to come into my house and sit. But because I have a flat face, I have communicated my words are saying something different and then my body is saying something different that is out. By the way, our body language is the first communication and it takes more percentage in communication. I think it takes 80, 70% and then the, the voice takes 30%. So therefore be conscious of your body language. Um, next slide is just uh, uh, showing you the techniques. Identify the key areas that you want to talk about uh, to transfer knowledge to. Then know the right people who are rich in this experience, ask them to tell the story, and then create a regular environment that you can hold these sessions. So story, storytelling, the beauty is we can also use a video, audio and video to tell these stories. And then now, questions. And I think I have seen a few questions come in. Over to you, Wangari. I think I've used more than the minutes that I thought I would use. Thank you. Asante sana, Madam Kitui. Thank you so much for uh, this uh, opportunity, this, this uh, presentation that you have uh, afforded to us. And uh, yes, it's a, it's, it's a full house of our presentation and we are really, really grateful that uh, you've uh, spent your time, not only to just uh, take us through this, but also with the preparations, um, with, also with the preparations for it. And also it's, it's been quite, um, quite, quite, a, quite a, a fulfilling one in terms of anyone who's coming here. I am sure you have been able to uh, enjoy quite a lot, discover and also learn. Uh, so, Madam Kitui, we have a couple of uh, inquiries or questions that had come in earlier. And at the same time, uh, we also have put out uh, to the fellows in case someone has uh, any question, then they can be able to.
Yeah. So, uh, so, uh, 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 Madam Kitri, yeah, yeah, it's good to be back. Uh, yes, I, I was saying that uh, we uh, we had put out that uh, if anyone has a question, they can be able to raise it. And uh, I see a, a comment before we go to some of the questions we had received earlier uh, from Margaret Kidai. I think the main target for mediation campaign is specific to the issues that are mostly related to the community or the region. And uh, this is coming from a question that uh, we put out asking, with, because one of the things you said is that uh, in setting up a media campaign uh, plan, yes, you did the general public, but who is the target? So it's important that we are also very, we are very, very specific. So I don't know what your comments would be, um, uh, Irene, uh, on, um, on that, on this comment from Margaret, that um, with regard to who would be uh, the, the, the target for, for media mediation campaign. Irene, over to you. Okay, thank you so much. And, and I think the first question is who, what is our objective? So before you even come and say, okay, this is for the mediators or the people we are looking for or the target, remember I said, what is your objective? Once you get your objective right, then you are able to know who your target audience is. So that's why we start with what is our, our objective. And I think I'll throw this back to you and say, yes. and everyone, what is our objective? And then from there is when we can now narrow it down to who is this? Because like I mentioned, every person has a different campaign um, and a, a different media channel that you can get. Them. I always tell people, if you want a campaign uh, to meet a target village, my village women in my village, uh, TV is not the, the, the channel for them. Uh, social media is not the channel for them because they don't even have smartphones. Uh, can you imagine with the 28 million Ugandans that are registered, it's only, I think I remember they were saying two or four million that have smartphones. So that means it already gives you a picture that my, yeah, the other woman in the village that I'm targeting is not even on, on, on social media. Maybe that's not a campaign for them. Uh, then radio would be something that easily reaches them. Storytelling, focus group discussions would be something that easily reaches them. So the objective is first, then the target audience and plan comes next. Hope I've answered the question right and clear. Yes, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, appreciated. Thank you for that. Uh, and 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 it's back uh, back again to the colleagues who are uh, in the conversation right now. Uh, with a med with a mediation ca media campaign or, or for advocacy, what would be the objective? I think that's the question that I'm hearing from uh, Madam Irene Kitui, and it would be interesting to hear. Uh, or to see on the chat what our views would be in terms of, and, and the views could be as diverse as they are on what um, mm -hmm. uh, mediation media campaign would actually be or an ad, um, advocacy. So the mm -hmm. other questions that we have, um, uh, uh, Madam Irene Kitui, is with regard to the social media. So is, uh, and the main question is uh, where social media is concerned because that has become a very active uh, tool or platform for uh, communication to, uh, for for uh, communication today uh, is is planning for a social media campaign and also planning for a uh, mainstream media or what you'd call the traditional media is uh, is the, is the planning for a social media campaign and the planning for a uh, uh, mainstream or uh, traditional media campaign the same and if it is not probably what's the distinction or what are the areas that are really really just the same over to you Madam Irene. Thank you very much. It's the same. It's, it's quite the same, but the packaging of the information and how the information is passed on is what varies. Now, all, me, all media advocacy campaigns, all media campaigns start with what is our objective, what is our target audience, and then what is our plan. So one of the things that we know, yes, radio is easy, but then 
how do you package that as well? The only thing that comes out uh, that makes a difference is the packaging and the target audience and how we know. One of the things that we have found out is social media, Facebook, you don't need to do a long post with the words. People don't read it. With over 500 words, no one will read it on Facebook because we are scrolling we are scrolling to what is the next story. And one of the things that we have realized is then with that, you need to make sure you're using visual uh, more and then uh, with few words. And then we realize is with social media, you combine, you're combining visual. And so if you're doing a video that can run on, uh, on uh, TV, it's the same video, you can break it into smaller pieces and the same video will run on YouTube channel. You will put it on your Facebook as well. You can put it also on Instagram as well. So they're similar. The only difference comes in the packaging of the information. You can hold a 30 minutes radio talk show. You will not hold Facebook, yes, they might. YouTube, the beauty about it, it keeps the information. Once you upload it, somebody can come back. The, the problem with radio, once it's gone, it's gone. The 30 minutes are gone. If you put the 30 minutes, if we have a talk show happening between now and uh, 10, it will be gone. But on YouTube, that will remain. People can go and stream again and again. So that's the only difference that you get implementation and also uh, how you package the information. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your, your, your remarks and uh, yeah, very good guidance, uh, Madam Titui. Uh, the other question we have is with regards to communication to the, 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 the male, female gender. Uh, is there any things that probably some, we need to be very alert to if you're having a communication that's going either targeted to women, a communication that's targeted to men, and then also when you have uh, a cross gender or a general communication, are there some specific nuances that uh, it may be worth to be alert to? Over to you, Madam Irene. Yeah, thank you so much. It's, that's where you come and understand your community. I'll, I'll tell you, my work with Straight Up Foundation made me have a lot of field trips. And um, <clears throat> in the field trips, we realized, and this is something that we learned on later on, that if we want to make the sessions more productive, we needed to separate the audiences at one point. So there, there's a point where I would put all the audiences together. We used to do a lot of focus group discussions and radio talk shows. but and the focus group discussions used to help us to generate the information that we bring to the radio talk shows. But one of the things we learned, there are times, uh, uh, I remember this was more specific in Karamoja region, where yes, the women would be attending the sessions, the men would sit in front and the women would sit behind. Now, even a woman has come for this meeting earlier than the man, yeah? the man has come in late, but the woman will move from the front seat and go behind because the man has come in. So all the men would be in front and then all the women would be behind. Now, if you ask them something, they would, they would let the men speak first until you specifically say, I want the woman to speak. And they first look at the men, whether they want to speak or not. It's like they're asking for permission. So we realize sometimes when you're talking about sensitive things that only uh, target women, then we used to separate them and talk to the women alone, then talk to the men alone, and then come back into a unified point and then bring them all together. So even in conflict or mediation, we need to be sure. When you realize you have to separate them to get your points clear, to get your stories clear, please do. The other thing that we used to do in radio, if a lady gave us a story and is too sensitive, we would remove their name and say, we, shall not going to, we are not going to put her name but you will hear the voice. And in, in studio, they can alter a bit so that you can sound a little different. So all those things happen and you should be putting that into mind, especially if you're looking at conflict transformation. At one point, you need to separate your audience. Thank you. 
Okay. Oh, yes, thank you, Madam Irene. And now uh, you can call us as uh, area. And especially um, in different different uh, types of work, um, you may you may find that uh, sometimes they, uh, there are uh, either assignments that involve uh, what you just started raising about uh, sensitive information. Either it's sensitive because of who is being handled, or who is interested in it. Uh, sometimes it may even border into issues of what is let's say called security, and as we know. Uh, the areas that relate to conflict, especially in very high conflict areas. Sometimes there are areas that are um, related to security and also at the same time, sometimes that are, you know, some things that are considered as let's say classified, um, whether you want to call it as classified information. And in the process of being involved uh, as a mediator, and yet we still would want to have, um, a, 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 let's say, for example, a media or an advocacy campaign around such an area, because it could either be the, the cause of the conflict, or it's fueling the conflict, or the connection with it would actually help a conflict to become uh, uh, deflated. How do we handle such areas that could be uh, sensitive? or that could involve sensitive information or that could be you know, uh, considered as uh, classified. Over to you, Madam Irene. So we, <clears throat> sensitive information classified, we need to understand why is it classified? What are the areas that under classification we can pick and not pick? I, I'll give examples. I don't understand very much in conflict management, but I'll give examples in <clears throat> uh, sexual reproductive health where I was involved in. So would have stories and uh, we have gone to a community and this girl has been raped and um, we want to bring her story out. So we would go and talk to her and say, ask her, do you want to talk to us? Of course, consent from the target audience is very key, consent. If they said don't, then you can use my story, but don't mention my name. I don't want to talk about it visually. You have to respect that. So you need to find out which areas can you use and which areas can't you use. If a person says, I want to tell you my story, you can use it, you can paraphrase it, but I will not, don't use my name, don't do that then you have to be careful on that. Of course, we would want to talk about raping the community, but not mention their names as well. So that would happen to us uh, as well. So sometimes would change in audio, would change the person's name. And you're very clear. You say, this thing happened in Kampala, in this village, but the person is not comfortable saying their name because they feel it will bring problems. So they have resorted to giving us the powers to say it. And that's why you notice that sometimes in um, TV, they blast somebody's face. I know most of you have seen TV and somebody's face is blood because they don't want you to know who they are. So work with the media to also understand how do they blur those people. Let the voice be said, let the person give their story, but branding those areas. So you just have to be specific. How do we go around areas of privacy and also where information is classified. What is classified, what is not classified. If there's a rape case, the name is classified, but the story itself is genuine and you need to make sure there's action or a report to be done. So you just have to know which areas are classified and which ones are not that still bring up the point that you want to bring. Thank you. Hope I've answered that very well. Yes, thank you very much for that insight. And let's move to the next part when um, a media campaign or a, a media initiative goes wrong. Your intention was uh, there was a plan and also it was intended that it would serve uh, 
or it would be understood in a certain way. And then, you know, it seems that things have gone, I mean, um, um, all, all over the place. Uh, yes, how do we get back on track or how do you, how do you have um, institutions or messages being able to be reclaimed so they can actually still uh, communicate what they were supposed to communicate. There are moments where there's need either for apologies or there's moments where there's need to probably, you know, go, uh, go, go, go low and then now make a comeback. Uh, what would be your insights on that? Thank you, Madam Irene. Uh, I, I think in my in the presentation, I remember I said be flexible, and I, and and the example I gave is you can start with Plan A and end up doing Plan D. So that, that's, that's the one thing you have to be flexible. You don't have, nothing is written on the stone in media when you're doing a media campaign. What you thought is the right way you might realize, oh, by the way, that's not the people. You might start and say, we want this campaign and we want to work with it. And our target audience is the community that is having this problem. And then you realize, no, it's the politicians who are bringing the problem. You have to swift very much, very fast and change and be able to target the politicians. So you have to be flexible and keep your ear on the ground because those changes happen. Like I told you, we used to go and have a focus group discussion and say, our target is to have a focus group discussion with men and women seated together and ask them together. And then we realized, oh my God, it doesn't work that way. Women will not speak until they get uh, power. But when you separate them, then they speak. So you have to be very flexible and have your ears on the ground. And that's the only way you can be able to, to meet that. And so you have to have constant meetings. How is the campaign going? Is it going the right way? Is this, the, we told the journalists this, and also the journalists train them, don't give them power because they'll speak some things when they don't know. That's why sometimes with media campaigns, you start with training the journalists. You ask the media houses, give me the journalists that I can work with and you train them. And that's why you see, there's journalists who report about sports and they don't report about any other thing because they're trained in the sports area. There are journalists who report about politics and don't report about other things. There are journalists who report about uh, economics and don't report about other things. So train them, but put your ears on the ground. Thank you. Uh, thank you for those insights, uh, especially around media. And now let's come to storytelling. Uh, just uh, two key questions around on, um, around storytelling, um, and uh, uh, the, the 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 aspect of storytelling. Um, you and you've you've covered uh, elements of it in your in your messaging. What makes it so attractive versus just uh, giving in? Uh, statements or uh, just giving in uh, or, or the way we have known how to give in statements and speeches. And here um, I'm speaking to if you could um, in the second part be able to give uh, us as uh, peers and as fellows advice because we are preparing to make uh, uh, presentations of uh, fellowship topics uh, which will be done in November at the November summit. But, uh, we have a key, a key uh, session which is next week uh, on Saturday where uh, fellows are making presentations to the fellowship director. Um, uh, uh, if you could kindly just pick an area and just create a, a 30 second story out of it, just to give us as an insight, that would be quite interesting. So two parts. Is uh, firstly, we are what's making storytelling, you know, such a, a, a very useful thing. And then also secondly, just pick an area and just give me, just transform it into a story. Um, and yet it was supposed to be a, a presentation that you were, you were to do. Uh, over to you, Madam Irene, then we will get to uh, the closing. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Now, storytelling brings the point uh, closer home and makes us feel we are part of the story. And um, I usually tell people that uh, storytelling is very good especially if it's in the local language and depending on the people you're dealing with. The local language is rich enough uh, because there are words, there are themes, there are those uh, things that we use in our words that make the story much better. Now, unfortunately, I'm using English. I wish I would speak in my mother tongue to, to the people I want to target. But this is, this is okay, let's our let, uh, Madam Irene. I had not thought Madam, about Madam it. Irene? Mm. 
Madam, yeah, let's do this. Please speak, speak, speak to the people yeah. in your mother tongue. And and then you give us <laughs> no, no. And, 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 yeah. and, yes. and then you know you, and you know and any and, and uh, I like that campaign. And you know why, Madam, Madam Irene, we actually uh, say this. Um we we have a, a campaign internally to to encourage mediators uh to to, to sign up to uh and uh, local language uh, vernacular speaking mediators uh, programming and your statement right now communicates to us that either we need to speak to people in their in the way they understand the language they understand this so it would be exciting to just hear you in uh your in your in your in your language and then you can always let us know what you actually told you, what you told them we will get it don't you worry <laughs> language is universal thank you <laughs> One of the things I know about uh, local language, when you speak the local language, translating it back to English, it loses a few meanings. Yeah? They are, uh, as you will understand this when I say this, so cool. there are those inner meanings that I have to really explain to you that would lose that. But I'll just try to say, this is something that we used, uh, and I'm, I remember it was the media advocacy campaign, and uh, this is what we were telling. Every, and it was aimed at encouraging family planning and planning for the children, and this is how we would tell the story. So, um, in Uganda, every day, there are 3,000 children who are born. Um, just think about it. And so let's break it down and see in a day is 24 hours. And then we have just mentioned that in a day, there are 3000 children who are born. So how many children are born in every hour? So what we need to do is to just divide that by 24. And that means 125 children are born every hour. So the hour I have just spent with you, there are 125 mothers who have just given birth. What does that mean? As a country, we need to be prepared to take care of these children. As you as a parent, that means you need to be prepared to take care of these children. Unfortunately, from the 3,000 that we have just mentioned, oh, there are 125 children that have just been given birth to today, 60% is from young people. That could be your daughter, that could be your son who has given impregnated the daughter. And unfortunately, some girls are denied after this uh, pregnancy or giving birth or when they get pregnant. Why? Because sometimes parents, we think that our children are so young, I will not tell them about sex. But forgetting that when you're keeping quiet to tell your children about sex, there's somebody else outside who is telling them. So it's better for you as a parent to talk to your child about sex and sexuality than letting the neighbor or the friend, because you don't know what they're telling them. In my life as a counselor, one of the things I met, I remember I went to talk to this family and this girl told me, Irene, thank you for talking to me at this time because my friend had told me I need to have sex and I was planning to have it uh, next weekend with my boyfriend because she described it as sweet, good pain. You see how it's packaged? Sex is packaged as sweet, good pain pain. Who doesn't want to feel sweet, good? It's a little painful, but it's sweet and it's good. I think all of us would want to experience that. So there are four. It's our role as parents to make sure that we talk to our children, give them the right information about sexuality so that we avoid cases where their friends are telling them information that is not right. Thank you. And that is for me my presentation on making sure that we need to help. So as parents, it's our role, it's our responsibility. Let's talk to our children. I don't think there's any proud parent who wants to be out in the community telling their friends that their children have got pregnant at 18 years old. We all want our children to grow and be at that wedding or that ceremony where we celebrate their marriage. Then 
teenage pregnancy. Thank you. Now, one of the things about my storytelling it will show you that I'm not prepared because it's, it was abrupt, but I hope I have communicated something. Over to you, Wangari. Okay, now nine in... o'clock, and uh, it's it's our time to be able to close uh, the, this 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 particular session. And uh, uh, it's been quite exciting to have you, um, Madam Irene Kitui. I will now invite you to please give us your closing uh, statement, uh, as uh, then we can be able to have the uh, Kenyan national anthem and close this uh, session, Madam Irene. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you for the audience and everyone who has uh, who has been in. Um, somebody saying I can do a video. Hope my video is clear. Can you see me in my video? Okay, thank you. So um, thank you very much for this opportunity to be able to share this about media advocacy and also uh, about storytelling. Um, I'm very passionate about media and how it's used. Um, like I mentioned, one of the things we need to know is what is our objective. Once we get our objective rightly, we shall be able to define our um, our um, our campaign very well and have come up with a target audience and also as well come up with a plan because those are the things that are going to run this campaign or everything. For the presentation that you're preparing, prepare and be able to talk about it freely and flexibly and happily. And, and when you're presenting, smile. Um, one of the things is even if somebody is not seeing you, they when you smile, they will, they'll be able to hear you. Smiling is something very important. Your body language is important in presentation as well. So smile, have always a smile, have a good voice, say things happily. And um, uh, with presentation, I know May had a lot of time, but you, I remember, I think it was seven minutes. And I remember I said this somewhere, um, my teacher told us when I was studying journalism that remember that when you're making a story, it should be as so short as the mini cut. And his analogy was the mini cut is short enough to cover the important parts, but uh, long enough to cover the important parts, but short enough to keep it attractive to bring people to look at it and all that. So never forget that when you're presenting, make it short uh, like a mini skirt in the way that it's long enough to get the point and and also short enough for people to get the point and not be bored and then um when you're doing a presentation always answer the questions uh, and this is we always say it's uh, one husband and four wives so one husband is the how uh the four wives are what, when, where, hmm? which, which one and who. So those have to be answered. Where did this happen? Who was involved? What did they say? Where and uh, all those, the four W's have to be catered for and the H. Always remember, if you forget anything as you're writing a story or, or talking, remember to put the four wives and one husband. And that is how I'll close because my class, next session class is beginning in a few. Thank you, Wangari. Asante Sana, Madam Irene, and uh, this, this has been a really, really a very special one. As I said, uh, we close uh, now with uh, the words of the national anthem. And I think the message that we take away all of us today is, uh, 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 I was about to say four husbands and uh, one wife. So yes, one husband and, uh, and four wives. <laughs> yeah, the how, uh, the what, the when, the where, and the who. And as fellows uh, yes. in the ongoing program, 
I believe that this is the strongest message that um, um, uh, that Madam Irene today. I think that is what she was sent here to to deliver to us, because we are preparing to make presentations. And those presentations that we are going to make, we have been given uh, four husbands and one wife to deliver. So we are looking forward, <laughs> fellows, to be able to uh, have uh, your presentations uh, that, that, that will be presenting to the fellowship director um, uh, next week on Saturday, just at exactly about the, at, at, at 10 a.m. in the morning uh, for the fellowship director's uh, matriculation weekend. And uh, yeah, we, uh, this has been a very useful session even for that. And also as we prepare for the seven minutes, uh, the session that will be coming up on, on, um, on Saturday will be for two minutes uh, presentation. But our main forum, our summit that will be in uh, November will be for seven minutes. So now we have, again, I say the four husbands and uh, yeah, one wife or anyway, as it's been said, one husband and four wives. To closing and colleagues who are on video, yeah, it's exciting to be able to see you. If you're able to get on video, you can do that so that we can be able um, to have the, uh, the, the, the group uh, photo that is, uh, is being taken on. Uh, in the meantime, Madam Irene Kitui, may God bless you and keep you well as you go forth. And uh, as, you, as, as, as we're having our discussion for today, so we now know that we can actually now go for the weddings. Eh? Now that we have the husbands and the wives, we can now go for the Saturday weddings. <laughs> and it's been a great delight to, to be with everyone on this particular call, on this call today. So we say the words of the Kenyan National Anthem and uh, we can close um, our discussion uh, uh, right away. So we'll again say the first stanza of the Kenyan National Anthem in Kiswahili. E mungu nguvu yetu ilete baraka kwetu haki iwe ngao na mlinzi na tukae na undugu amani na uhuru raha tupate na ustawi I thank you all for joining us for this session we got to keep you well and have a good the rest of the day Madam Irene siku njema have a blessed day and enjoy your class God bless Thanks Anna God bless my Hello, everyone still on the call. Thank you for joining and uh, have a good the rest of the, the day. I hope it was uh, very useful for everyone who was here.